Welcome to The Spiritual Masters, a podcast from Tan Books and Tan Direction, in which we look at the greatest and holiest writers from Catholic history. Join us as we explore the life and times in which they lived, an overview and study of their greatest works, and how we as Catholics can look to these masters as models for our own holiness on our journey to heaven. Welcome back to Tan Fans for another great podcast on spiritual masters. You know, Tan is a publisher of the saints, and in this uh, series, we're focusing on great saints who maybe have not had as much coverage and popularity as they should uh, in, in recent years. And so we're here today with our, our very special guest and uh, translator and partner here at Tan, Father Robert Nixon. Thank you for being here, Father. Thanks very much, Carter. It's a pleasure to be here talking to you today. So, we're talking about the great Ser seraphic doctor of the church, St. Bonaventure. And uh, I'm, I have a special uh, appreciation for the Franciscans. I've been to a CC three times or maybe four times, uh, considered being a Franciscan at one point, I guess, in my life before I met my wife. And um, I love their spirit and their charism, and I love the works of Bonaventure that I've read, especially uh, this new work that we have coming out that we're going to talk about in our next episode entitled The Seven Last Words of Christ that you've so beautifully translated. Um, but in this episode, we're going to focus on Bonaventure the man and his life and times and works. Yeah. Um, but let's begin with a prayer seeking Bonaventure's intercession for us. O oh Lord, we ask that you guide our conversation today in paths of wisdom and truth. We ask this through the intercession of your seraphic doctor, Saint Bonaventure, and all the early Saint, all the early Franciscan saints, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You know, Saint Bonaventure was uh, quite the. I don't know. The Renaissance man, or he was uh, not just a Franciscan, he was a bishop, he was a cardinal, he was a great professor, he was a spiritual writer, a theologian, and also a world-class philosopher. Um, I get the sense he was even a good administrator. He was just kind of good at whatever he did. Um, but what can you tell us about this man and his early life and yeah. uh, and his um, how he was uh, destined to become a Franciscan? <laughs> Yeah, so a, a very remarkable character, Bonaventure, and um, the the Franciscan order. Uh, was I was actually thinking of becoming a Franciscan before I became a Benedictine at one stage in my life. And um, Saint Bonaventure, well, he was born. We don't know too much about his family, but he was born uh, in about twelve twenty, and um, we do know from what he's related that when he was a, a young infant, he fell very ill and his life was in peril. And at this stage, um, St. Francis of Assisi was, was still alive and was venerated throughout Italy. So his mother took the infant uh, Bonaventure, or Giovanni as he was known then, hmm. uh, to visit St. Francis, who was revered as a living saint, and asked for his prayers that the infant would survive. And... Um, at that point, um, the prayers of St. Francis were answered and, and young Bonaventure recovered. And she committed him to a life of service in the Franciscan order. And so it came to pass. We shouldn't imagine, though, that he became a Franciscan only because his mother had promised him. Um, he felt also that as, as a call for God and felt very inspired by, by the life of St. Francis. And in the, day, the early days of the Franciscan order, they were spreading uh, extremely rapidly throughout Italy, especially and, and throughout other parts of Europe. These were the, this was the time of Saint Francis, uh, Saint Anthony of Padua, and then very shortly after Saint Bonaventure. So he entered the Franciscans at the age of about twenty, and was very soon distinguished himself by his uh, scholastic capacity. So was sent to the University of Paris to study. And the University of Paris at that time was the great academic center um, of, of the church and of Europe. And there he distinguished himself very quickly by his wonderful theological writings and soon rise, rose to become a very distinguished professor. 
Now, um, it happened also around this time while he was serving in Paris that he was elected superior general of the Franciscan order. And somewhat reluctantly, because he was a very humble man, he, he took on this great role. And at this time, the Franciscan order was, was still an emerging organization and there were, there were various divisions within it. There were those who felt that we should do exactly what St. Francis did, practice literal poverty that the order shouldn't even own any property uh, as, a, as a kind of corporate entity, um, that it didn't need to have a juridical structure and so forth. Where there are others who were, who were seeking to, to organise the order a little bit more so that it could function more effectively, so that it would be able to send people for formation for the priesthood and for studies and so forth. So Bonaventure was uh, instrumental in reconciling and holding together these two groups as best as he could. So he wrote uh, firmly in defence of the what, what the leadership of the Franciscan order was doing, but also wrote with a great deal of sympathy for those who preferred to follow the literal lifestyle of poverty. Um, and he became also involved in, in the church at a leadership level. So he was instrumental in the election of Gregory X hmm. as Pope. And shortly after this, um, Gregory X asked him to become Cardinal Bishop of Albano in Italy, which he again reluctantly accepted. Now, if we look at his corpus of writings, we find there's an immense amount of stuff there. There are the scholastic writings, his commentaries on the sentences of, um, of Peter Lombard. Peter Lombard, yeah. Um, his various books of of distinctions, um, almost it's almost as large as the theological writings of Thomas Aquinas. On top of this, he also wrote a, a huge number of mystical works on mystical theology. The best known of which today is probably the Iteranium Mentis in Deum, the journey of the mind into God, and and this book is an absolute classic talks about the mind's progressive journey into God through a series of, of meditative steps. He, he wrote also a lot of wonderful instructions for people living the religious life and the spiritual life. He wrote a great deal of poetry as well, fantastic poetry, um, most of which hasn't been uh, translated into English. It's quite difficult to translate into English because the Latin rhymes so consistently and to, to keep that in English is really, really hard. And if you lose the rhyme, you lose a lot of the effect of it. Um, one of his most outstanding works, though, in poetic form is the, uh, the Seven Last Words of Christ. And this was uh, supported by a range of, of commentaries on these seven last words, which are scattered throughout his other works. Um, but he was a, a, a wonderful author. And when we look at his life, and we reflect that he lived only for 53 years. He died in about uh, 1273. Um, it's amazing that one person could do so much. And Thomas Aquinas was a, a close friend of his. And they, um, Thomas Aquinas once commented when, when he found out that St. Bonaventure was writing the life of St. Francis of Assisi, he said, it's fitting that the life of one saint should be written by another saint. So he regarded Bonaventure as a saint while he was still alive. And Bonaventure, of course, had a very high regard for Thomas as well. So Bonaventure was invited to write the liturgy for the feast of Corpus Christi, which was a newly established feast at that time. And he said, look, I'm, I'm not worthy of this. Give it to my friend Thomas. He'll do a much better job than I could. So we see this wonderful uh, relationship uh, of 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 mutual esteem and, and mutual humility between these two great figures, Bonaventure and Thomas. Where they differ, I guess, is that most of uh, Thomas' work is written for, for students of theology. That's, it's scholastic. That's what that means. It's basically textbooks to help them prepare for their exams. Whereas Bonaventure wrote some books like that, but he also wrote a lot more spiritually and, and mystically at times. And it's those mystical works of Bonaventure which, uh, which are my particular love. I was going to ask you about what is 
mystical theology? Because I, I often see his name associated with that. Is it just theology that's distinguished from scholastic theology? What does mystical theology really refer to? Uh, so mystical theology is, uh, is an approach to theology which has its ultimate goal in contemplation, in the uh, leaving behind of, of all thoughts and words and concepts to have this encounter by God, with God, an unmediated encounter with God. So um, that is very much what mystical theology is about. And, and that is, I think, where, um, where Bonaventure really excels, mm -hmm. you know. I, I saw a quote once that said um, Bonaventure was the saint who did theology on his knees. Yeah. And it's referring to it was a pr theology for him was a spiritual work because the purpose of it was to enlighten the mind and, and motivate the heart to be more intimate with God as opposed to just um, learning um, for learning's sake. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that's a very insightful comment, um, Connor. And when we read um, Bonaventure's work, there's often a blurred line between this theology and mysticism. So his mysticism is always firmly grounded in, in, in a strong and solid theology, but his theology is always done with a kind of prayerful humility and openness to this um, as he would describe it as this um, illuminating ray of light. Mm. So, uh, yeah, definitely a wonderful author in that respect. And, of course, that was um, – when we read the life of Thomas Aquinas, <coughs> that was part of his life as well. It's just sure. he was writing in a, in a particular genre. He was writing to help students prepare for their exams. Well, but it does seem that there's an – a difference in emphasis between the Franciscan tradition and the Dominican tradition. Well, well that would that would be true. That and the church needs that. Like the church yeah. needs these different temperaments, you know. Um, to very have, much so. You know, so it's it's fine. It, the church's umbrella is very large, and um, you know <coughs> it has to have all of those. So another thing I wanted to mention to you, I think this is in perfect keeping with everything you're saying. I I found a quote one day, um, actually reading Etienne Gilson's biography or a short biography on the life of Bonaventure. Um, it's more of a preface to one of Bonaventure's collected works. And it had a quote in there by Bonaventure and I printed it out on paper and I put it above my computer screen in my office. And it says, it's actually a Latin phrase, which I can't ever remember how to say it exactly in Latin. But what it says is you cannot know the words of St. Paul if you do not have the spirit of St. Paul. And it's yeah. a quote by Bonaventure. And that was sort of his teaching in the sense of if you want, if you want to understand the words of a saint, you sort of have to have the spirit of a saint. Yeah. And I find that to just be a per perfect um, sort of segue, I think, into investigating the works of Bonaventure. You could easily change that up and say, you cannot know the words of Bonaventure if you do not have the spirit of Bonaventure, yeah. you know? And so um, that's that's what's important, I think, in, in investigating these spiritual masters is to uh, kind of know it, their spirit it, it is, so it that is. then we can better understand their words. Yeah, yeah. And and I think reading the works of Bonaventure also works the other way. It, it, it imbues the reader with something of his spirit. Mm. And he was a saint who was always looking at the, you know, at this kind of uh, – divine illumination. It's interesting that he chose the name Bonaventura as his religious name, and it, it, it means in Latin, good things to come. Hmm. So he was always focused on on the eternal realities of heaven. So yeah, um, a, a wonderful saint and very, very illuminating, very enlightening. I always find him very, uh, very touching to read his works. So he was given the name Seraphic Doctor. You know, the different doctors yeah. have different. So give us some examples of some other doctors like Bernard and Aquinas. Uh, yeah, you know, so, so, but that's okay. a special one. A Seraphic so, yeah. is about as good as you so, get. So we've got uh, Ed Selb, the Doctor Magnificus, who we uh, spoke about. Um, Bernard of Clairvaux, the Doctor Mellifluous, the Mellifluous or the Honey Flowing Doctor because of his eloquence. Um Dun Scotus, who is not uh, – he's a blessed, not a saint yet, um, is known as the uh, subtle doctor. Hmm. Um, Raymond Lull, who is one who we're talking about uh, doing his life, uh, 
is known as the illuminated doctor. Hmm. Um, William of Ockham, who was never actually made a saint, he's probably not a, really a right. but he's known as the more than subtle doctor, <laughs> which is slightly ironic. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, Dennis the Carthusian, the ecstatic doctor. Wow. Um, Thomas Aquinas, of course, the angelic doctor. Yeah. And um, probably the most, uh, Albert the Great, the doctor universalis, the universal doctor. Uh, but Bonaventure, I think, is the is the highest possible appellation that can be given, which is the uh, the seraphic doctor. So this is talking about the uh, the the seraphim, the angels, who are the very highest rank uh, in the celestial court and who are in the presence of God, who have no other role but the contemplation of of the face and the glory of God. I think this is a very fitting title that's given to uh, to Bonaventure. And perhaps the difference between the angelic doctor, um, because the angels, uh, you know, is the is a, a lower rank, but they they're involved in the administration of earthly things, uh, go betweens between heaven and earth. And Thomas Aquinas did this very well because his work, his writing at least, uh, is focused on helping out students, you know, to prepare for their exams, on giving them the knowledge in a clear and, and concise way. Whereas um, with Bonaventure, I think there's much more of this contemplation of the divine glory shining through. Which is a perfect name for somebody who does theology on their knees. Indeed. Uh, well, I look forward to getting more into uh, his particular work that you've translated for us on the seven last words of Christ. And uh, so in the next episode, we're going to dive into that. But uh, this has been a great overview of Bonaventure, and I hope that he intercedes for us and our continued conversation. And I hope that uh, our customers and listeners begin to actively engage with Bonaventure in their prayer life. Um, he is such a powerful saint and is often um, kind of put in that category of theologians over there in the corner that you study in school, as opposed to somebody who's useful to us in our day-to-day -day life. So with that, um, I thank you for being here and thank you for all this great insight and background to the great spiritual master, St. Bonaventure. God bless you, Father. Thank you. Thanks so much, Connor. This has been an episode of The Spiritual Masters, a podcast brought to you by TAN. To follow the show, learn about more inspiring holy men and women, and to support the Spiritual Masters and other great free content from TAN, visit spiritualmasterspodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code MASTERS25 to get 25% off your next order, including works by St. Bonaventure and countless more spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. And thanks for listening.